So a privilege to be here, an honor to be here. Always enjoy uh, worshiping here. So blessed by, by music, by lesson study, by our prayer time. Um, wonderful congregation. So ultimate mission, I just want to say uh, a few words about it, is something for about the past six months I've taken on to promote and, and make awareness of in our churches where I can because I really believe in their mission. You noted uh, the goal there. One of them is to promote the equality of women, particularly overseas. Now, you have a pamphlet in your hands, and thank you, those volunteers who handed these out. But um, what Ultimate Mission does, incidentally, this was uh, originated in Gladstone Park, a church by Jim Reynolds. You saw him doing the interview there uh, some years ago. If you've been at camp meeting, you may have seen a couple presentations that he has made. But the goal of Ultimate Mission is to train women in local areas, India, uh, Nepal, uh, Philippines, uh, Ethiopia are some places that they have been. And there are 224 of these women that are sponsored by Ultimate Mission. They are overseen by med local medical professionals who train them uh, in basic health practices and they can take that information and help women in villages to prepare for pregnancy, how to take care of their children, proper diet, all of those kinds of things. And so it is just a, a beautiful uh, beautiful ministry and you can see you saw on the screen what the needs are and were I'm just wanting uh, this, uh, Just taking this opportunity to make you aware of it. I don't like high pressure I don't want that on you But if this is something that the Spirit of God has spoken to you and you would like to contribute to It would be a blessing to these women and, and, and other ones that are, will be hired to, to do this ministry of uplifting humanity through uh, health ministry. Particularly in India, this has been effective because India is not a place that's that open now. You can't just go in and do evangelism that easily, but you can train women to go into homes and help other women and children, and that, gets, that creates a, a pathway into the heart where you can begin to share other things uh, and gospel. So... Anyway, that's in your hands. If, uh, if you want to give something today, you can give me an, an envelope on the way out or just keep it and send it in. And if you can't do that, if you're not able to do that, just pray for the mission, all right? So just that awareness today about ultimate mission, uh, healthy heart. So, <clears throat> wow, I was, I was so so sad to hear that uh, Denny uh, Nutter had had a, a stroke. I was emailing back and forth with him this week in pre preparation to bulletin, and he didn't say anything about it, so I didn't know. If you're watching, Denny, uh, prayers are with you. Uh, concerns, and, and I know your prayers are, are with him as well. Awesome guy. Love Denny uh, very much. I want you to, uh, I want to invite you to join me in opening your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, so just keep your, your thumb or your finger in there. But um, I want to start by saying I, um, I learned this week that horses have con a conscience. <laughs> I mean, animals have a conscience, right? And I just never thought of it in connection with horses. And I, I learned this week that, that they do. My wife was noticing in our garden that uh, the tops of our lettuce, uh, you know, and our spinach and, and our carrots and so forth were eaten off. The choicest parts were eaten off. And we were thinking it's the deer because we have a little gap in the corner fence toward the pasture. Sometimes we have coyotes out there and uh, all kinds of different animals. So that's who we were blaming. Or maybe the rabbits. Maybe the rabbits were extra hungry. But then my son saw that there was a horse 
eating our rosebuds out in our backyard. And he had pushed through that fence corner and was, when I went out, eating the choicest greens that we have in, in the back part of the lot. So I grabbed a rope and I went out and I guess I wasn't very tender. I just held the rope up and said, beat it. <laughs> and I've never seen a horse move so quickly from a standing start. He, he, uh, he put his head down, the body language was very telling, and kind of tucked his tail between his legs, and out he went out of there. He knew he was doing wrong. He knew he was not supposed to be there. <laughs> so I learned that horses have consciences. Humans also have consciences. It reminds me of a little story about a, a man who was, had come home from work. Uh, he, was, he was out in the living room. He was tired. But he wanted to know what time it was. His little three-year-old daughter by the name of Susie was in the kitchen. He couldn't see her, but he called out to her and said, Susie, what is the little hand on? He wanted the time. There was a long pause, and the answer came back, a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> so humans have consciences, and it's a good thing, right? It's a good thing. But in Genesis chapter 4, we come across an individual that we know about, most of us, almost all of us, by the name of Cain, who seems to have wounded his conscience. So I'm just going to read through the first few verses here of Genesis chapter 4. Familiar story. Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord, and again... Uh, bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a, and um, my sermon title today is Keepers. That's going to be a key word uh, as we go through our time together. Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the first fruits of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. And the Lord said, Cain, why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its, di its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to his brother Abel, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> Am I my brother's keeper? Now, the downcast face of Cain is telling. There is guilt here, there is envy here, there is jealousy here. He is an unhappy man. And it's the guilt that he has that burdens him alongside the anger and the jealousy of his brother and the fact that the Lord has not accepted his offering. There's four ways that you and I can relate to guilt. One is to project, projection, to blame somebody else. That was the tactic that Adam and Eve, Cain's parents used when they had sinned, when they had fallen, was to say, the devil made me do it, or the woman you gave me, you know, project the pain. The second and more responsible approach to guilt is to admit that you're guilty, take responsibility, own the sin, and confess and forsake it. That's the healthy way to deal with guilt. A third way is to just totally deny it and say, I didn't do it. I did nothing wrong. Denial. Complete denial. And then the fourth, which is connected, is deflect or deflection. To, to turn aside. That's Cain's approach, and he offers an excuse. Am I my brother's keeper, and it's the keeper part I want to focus on today. 
<clears throat> this word keep is kind of a um, key term in the first part of the narrative of the Genesis story. And we can see it uh, <clears throat> here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. We're not going to read it. But Adam and Eve, uh, Adam in particular at this point in Genesis 2, is commissioned to be a watcher, a keeper uh, of, of his universe, of the world that God has created and put him in. Uh, the Hebrew word term shamar, which is translated variously, keeper, watcher, or guard, as we see in Genesis 3, verse 24, where we have cherubim who are placed at the entrance of the Garden of Eden. They're placed there because God has, has had to determine that if man has access to the tree of life, he will perpetuate sin forever. And so he has to bar the way into the Garden of Eden. And so here again we see this term to uh, keep, to protect, to watch, and that is the responsibility of the cherubim. And then we find it here with Cain where he says, am I my brother's keeper? So what Cain is doing, he's doing more than just denying being his brother's keeper. He's actually thumbing his nose in God's face uh, and shoving aside the responsibility that he has as a human being who's supposed to have dominion over the earth. And what amazes me about this story and why I'm here today um, with this particular message is God's attitude toward Cain in particular. God's attitude toward humans who have fallen, who are guilty, who are high-handed and bold even in their sin. Because we find God's response is so gracious. This kind of goes along with what we studied in our lesson this morning uh, about uh, unity in the family and honoring each other and submitting to one another. It's in that same mode. I, like, I just love how God approaches Cain in this situation. As a good parent, he asks questions to get out of Cain uh, his own feelings and to own his, his guilt, to own his sin. He asks in verse 6, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? Cain, think about it. Why? Good parental skill. It's not pointing a finger. It's just saying, you know, why, wh what's happening? Why is this happening? Why are you so angry and why is your face fallen? And then this, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. The de the, its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. <clears throat> Bible scholars are almost unanimous in saying that Genesis chapter 4, verse 7 is the most difficult uh, verse in the Old Testament to translate. Translators struggle with this verse because different terms can be translated in two different ways. And they will tell you, you can look in commentary, uh, commentaries about this, that depending on which way you go, you know, you can come up with a different direction and a different message from what the Lord is saying here to Cain. So the, the first phrase is the word sin, or the first word, the first word that gives translators problems is the word sin. You'd think, well, that's rather simple, but it's not so simple because the, the term kata'at can mean sin offering. It can be just as easily translated sin offering. It is unusual in, in the Bible for sin, uh, a sin to be characterized as a lion crouching at the door that you have to rule over. So that's one thing that could be argued against the traditional translation that is given here. A 
A third one, or a second challenge, is the word lies. Sin is laying at your door because that word lies or is laying is most often used in pasturing a herd or a flock of sheep. As it is in Psalms 23, verse 2, where it says, He, God, makes me, David says this, He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Okay? So it's kind of a pastoral type of term. Another key word is the word door. Sin is at your door. It's lurking there at your door. And in the Old Testament, this term is used 40 times in reference to the tabernacle of the heavenly sanctuary. I'm, I'm, I'm going to come around to what I'm saying here in just a minute, but just, just building a little background here. So, what is God saying to Cain? Well, interestingly enough, these different terms and this context lends to what we see in Genesis chapter 1 through 3 that alludes to and connects with the sanctuary of God. That Eden was a sanctuary and is the earthly sanctuary modeled after Eden. You remember the candlestick, the candelabra in the holy place? It always had almond bud, uh, buds on it. It was understood as a tree, and often in Jewish thought, a tree of life. And so that is an allusion to, to the sanctuary in Eden. Um, so here are some parallels. We have cherubim placed at the east gate here in Genesis, uh, in chapter 3, verse 24. They are also, cherubim we know are in the most holiest place, uh, on the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus 25. Uh, in Genesis 3, verse 8, we have God's immediate presence, which was in the Ark of the, uh, was in the most holy place, and that he walked around. He walks around with Adam and Eve uh, in the garden, and he walked among his people, according to Le Leviticus 26, 12, uh, in, in the sanctuary. Adam and Eve are to serve and to guard. That's the watching aspect that we referred to either. Uh, earlier, the priests. The priests in Numbers 3, uh, chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, are to serve and to guard. Exact same language and terminology that's used here. We have precious metals and stones. The priests, remember the breastplate? They had all the different colored uh, uh, stones, precious stones on their breasts, and there's precious metals in Eden. And then one last one I've already mentioned, the tree, the tree in the mist, and God dwells in the midst, according to Exodus. So what we have here is possibly, and we have a number of our own Adventist scholars who promote this and believe in this, that what God is saying to Cain is... Cain, I, kinda, I know where you're going to go. But you can do well and you can do right by bringing a sin offering here at the gate. And if you do that, you will be, your face will be lifted up and you will be happy. So what God is, what God is offering Cain here before he goes any further is the second chance to bring another offering. And I think this is beautiful. And I, I tend to believe this is what the intent of the verse is, based on the association with the word door, uh, lie, watch, keep, and the sin offering uh, issue. There are at least ten strong allusions or types uh, in Genesis 1 through 4 to the sanctuary. We've just hit on five of them. And there are 16 such in Exodus 25 through 31 that are sanctuary connected back to Genesis 2. And so to me, this is a very attractive uh, explanation for this. Richard Davidson, one of our Adventist scholars, says, In this book, verse, 
God is encouraging Cain to offer up an animal sacrifice for sin at the eastern door of the garden where the post-fall sanctuary was located. So what I see here is God's grace reaching out, not just giving Cain a warning uh, against the fact that sin is at his door and that he has to overcome it, but it's an act of grace offering in the opportunity, do the right thing, Cain, bring an offering. You've missed, the, you've, you've missed the right offering, bring the right offering. Bring the sin offering and receive grace. And this certainly accords with what we read in, in Romans 5, verse 8, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Amen? So if Cain, and of course we know that Cain did not listen to God. <clears throat> and in verse 6, it says that Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother? Again, these questions. Where is your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. There were some things that came together for me in reading Mendelssohn's book, The Lost. I don't know if you've ever read The Lost um, by Mendelssohn. Anyone here read The, the, the Lost by Mendelssohn? He's a Jew who writes, uh, he's a Holocaust, Holocaust survivor, who writes about what happened in Poland to his grandparents during the Holocaust. And in this he brings out that the word blood here is in the plural, which seems to indicate that what Cain did was a brutal, brutal murder. His bloods cry to me from the ground. And the word cries is also in the plural. Like multiple wounds, multiple cries, it was the worst kind of murder. And now God goes on and says, you are cursed from the ground which opens its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. And when you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and wander to the earth. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Cain does not understand the nature of his sin. He does not understand the depth of his sin. And so he complains that he is ill-treated. But the Lord in his graciousness, in spite of this, puts a mark on Cain, the rest of the, the uh, narrative tells us, so that he won't be killed, protects him. That is amazing to me, that God is that gracious. Because Cain deserves far worse, <laughs> far worse than what he gets. Which brings us to um, Christ's sacrifice of himself as the lamb for our justification. There's the lamb at the door, which apparently Adam and Eve, that was where they could worship, was at the door of Eden. There at the gate where the cherubim were and where he invited Cain to come and offer his, his sacrifice. And we, of course, he did not obey, he did not do that. And I think it's fascinating the, the connection between not accepting Christ's sacrifice and how we treat brother, our brothers, right? You know, if we don't keep that connection in mind because of God's grace toward us, if we haven't received that, we're much less likely to treat others better treat others right. The very strong connection there in those two principles. <clears throat> Jesus was wounded for our transgressions, wasn't he? He was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for transgressors. A number of years ago, uh, quite a number of years ago when I was pastoring in Idaho, I had the privilege of going out to the Idaho State Penitentiary and giving Bible studies to some of the inmates. 
One of the inmates that I studied with was a convicted murderer, but he was interested in, in reading the Bible and dedicating his life to Christ. I often looked at the number that he had on it. I don't remember, I think it was five or six digits, and I don't remember all the numbers. I remember there were two sevens, a six, and I think a one. And I often thought, would I take his number on me and let him go and I stay here? I don't know if you've ever been in a penitentiary or a jail, but when you go in there and those big gates slam shut, <laughs> it's not a good feeling. But that's essentially what Christ did for us. He took our number. He traded places with us. He got in our shoes, in our striped uniform, <laughs> our bodies, and gave us freedom, gives us freedom. Cain's reaction is contrasted with an experience or actually something that I saw on Facebook uh, just this last March. And I want to share it with you. I had an intern, um, it's been like 20 years ago. His name is Jared, Jared Spano. Anybody know Jared Spano? He was a pastor here in the, in the Oregon Conference, not too far away on the other side of the river. But he posted this on, on Facebook. He has two da daughters, uh, one by the name of Gianna, who is um, probably seven or eight. And then he has a daughter, Catalina, and her name is five, uh, her age is five years. And um, these are them. So I'm just going to read what he shared. They were true, uh, the, the one, a true sister's keeper. He said, this afternoon, I asked Gianna if she had let the dogs go out to the potty. She said, no, not yet. So I told her she needed to do it right away because they had been taken out for a while. But she decided to go and do something else instead. Anybody relate? <laughs> sure enough, within 20 minutes, Bandit, that's the dog, had an accident, accident in the middle of the kitchen floor. I told Gianna that I was not disappointed that the dog had had an accident, but I was disappointed that she chose not to obey and that he had to go to the potty so bad he had no choice but to use the floor. I then told her what her consequences would be, part of which would be cleaning the floor. She acknowledged that she deserved her consequence and then said she was sorry and would be more careful next time. So my heart melted. But then the most beautiful thing happened. I caught Catalina and Gianna hugging as Catalina said, now this is the little one, the youngest one, I will take your consequence for you, Gianna. Jesus took mine for me so I can take yours for you. Five years old. Now this isn't the first time that Catalina has been willing to take consequence for Gianna. And Gianna has on several occasions taken consequences for Catalina. I grew up with a brother who was 18 months older than me. He's a pastor as well. We, we get along well. But in our growing up years, I can tell you, we had some battles. We had some battles. And sometimes I got blamed for what he did, and sometimes he got blamed for what I did. And I was, you know, if, if, if I got the discipline, I was always poor Abel, and he was Cain, right, you know? <clears throat> but sometimes that's the way it is with siblings. Sometimes we take consequences even for things we didn't do. But this is the first time, Jared goes on, that my five-year-old made the connection between this and being what Jesus did for her, so this is what he was going to do for her sister. And he ends, thank you, Jesus, for your faithful work in speaking heaven's light and love to my daughters. I am overwhelmed. And in the context of the story that we look at today, I see this as the personification of truly taking care of each other. Uh, little Catalina being uh, a sister's keeper for her older sister. Jesus 
is the ultimate keeper. He fulfilled the mission that Adam was supposed to fulfill. Jesus said uh, in John 17, verse 12, in his prayer for unity at the end of his life, as he's headed in the next few hours to Gethsemane and on to the cross, he says to the Father, while I was with them, I did what? I kept them in your name, which you have given me, and I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except, he adds, uh, Judas calls him the son of perdition. I'm thankful today that Jesus is the ultimate keeper. He is a brother's keeper. And in response to Christ's love and to the commission we are given from creation, we are the keepers of our parents, our husbands, our wives, our children, our wider families, our friends, our community. By the way, I really affirm this church for your connection with the community and what you do. I'm speaking to the choir uh, and our world. We are stewards of our world as well and keepers of our world. We are guardians of their safety, their reputations, their health and well-being, not as spies, but as keepers. And I want to be a better keeper to my family, to my community, and to my world. And I hope that is your goal as well as we commit ourselves to Jesus. Uh, could everybody pl please stand for our closing song? from day to day, but you're in charge and we know we can trust you. You're a brother's keeper. You have kept us. You will keep us. Lord, I pray that you will be with this church individually, corporately, continue to bless its, its mission, its school. I know the Pathfinders are out there today and 
uh, enjoying the outdoors, uh, protect and keep them. Uh, thank you for sunshine. Thank you for Sabbath. Bless us through the remainder of these precious hours. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Happy Sabbath. God bless you.